Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we continue our Farm Stress Series. This week, if anyone understands pressure, it's Edward Jenkins. In Southern Gardening, things get hot with these ornamental peppers. And speaking of hot, the heat's still on, the wide impact of drought on the cattle industry. And back to our series, Everywhere This Farmer Says, another source of stress on the farm. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Jonah Holland. And I'm Mike Russell. So good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. This week, an encore of our series On the Farm. Today, meet farmer Edward Jenkins in Grace, Mississippi in the Delta. His Emmy-winning story is made possible by producer James Parker and MSU Films. When I started farming, Jenkins Farm consisted of a thousand acres, which was purchased by my dad in the 40s and 50s. My family has grown it to about 2,000 acres, and we mainly grow soybeans and corn in a rotation. Right now, I, I mainly manage the farm. The fun part is driving the tractor. That's the, that's the easy part. I, I have the hard job, and uh, I, I have to keep everybody going. It's like Mr. Reed, he, he, he's on the tractor. He has to worry about one tractor. I got four tractors running, so I got to worry about four tractors. So they keep me busy all day, going place to place. In these days, mistakes cost a lot of money. It ain't like it was in the 80s. You could make a couple mistakes and keep going. You make a couple mistakes in the 2000s, you'll be out of business. Farming is a stressful job, and it comes from all different places. Some of the biggest stresses in farming, I would start with the weather. The weather would be the biggest stress. You have to get that perfect balance of things like rain. It has to rain just enough, but not too much, and it has to rain in the appropriate times during the year to make sure that you plant on time and then harvest in time. The crop uh, these days doesn't last long in the weather. If uh, you got two or three rains on a soybean crop, it would deteriorate and you would lose 50% of it either to falling out on the ground or, or rot. The last two years, we, we've had 200 acres that we didn't get planted because of the backwater and seepage water from the, from the river. So that's 200 acres that we didn't get a chance to harvest. Farmers, they're under enormous amount of stress all the time just because of uncertainties. Uncertainties because of the weather and also uncertainties in things like prices. 
throughout the year, farmers are constantly you know, watching prices, seeing if they go up, if they go down, and planning for that. The market is probably the biggest thing in farming right now because uh, the varieties of crops, everything yields good. You know, we, 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 we boost the, uh, the yield up, I think, pretty good, but we can't, we can't control the prices. Next year compared to last year on a soybean, it might be $2 per bushel difference. And for a farmer my size, that could be eighty dollars to $100,000 difference in, in uh, profit. When I first started farming, 50 bushels per acre was a good crop, and you could make money. You would go broke today making 60 bushels. If you wasn't making 80 or 90, you're not going to make any money. So it's, uh, it's a lot more money in, into it, so that's, that's going to make it a lot more stressful and a lot easier to go out of business if you, ha you, know, if you have a loss because uh, your inputs are so expensive. Edward talks more about those inputs and about the kind of pressure he was feeling from just about every direction in the conclusion of his story later in the show. This week in our Southern Gardening segment, Red Hot Frilly Peppers, the kind that look good in the landscape but are edible if you dare. Here's Eddie Smith with more. Today I'm in the trial gardens at the MSU South Mississippi Branch Experiment Station looking at some great examples of ornamental peppers. The purple flash pepper plant is absolutely stunning and features dark, almost black foliage with occasional flashes of bright purple or white on its leaves. These beautiful leaves retain their color throughout the growing season and have a slightly glossy texture. The plant produces small dark purple flowers that develop into tiny jet black fruit, which matures into a fiery red color. Another pepper plant that caught my eye is the versatile Sedona Sun. These plants are typically bushy and compact, growing to a height of around 18 inches and a width of around 12 inches. They produce small, cone-shaped, upright peppers that turn bright yellow when ripe. The Samba DK orange pepper plant is another great option for adding a pop of color and spice to your landscaping. Its vibrant, small, cone-shaped, upright fruit turn a beautiful orange color when ripe. Finally, the masquerade pepper plant is a real showstopper with fruit that changes color from purple to orange and then matures to a bright red. Overall, any of these unique and attractive plants will add both color and spice to your landscape. All of these ornamental peppers are edible. However, I should mention they are really hot, so eat them with caution. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in the conclusion of our Farm Week feature on Edward Jenkins, farm stress, farmers know all about it, and if you're not one, you'll understand a whole lot more when you watch his story. Edward Jenkins drives a tractor and knows what it takes to make a living in the Mississippi Delta. He also knows that mistakes put farmers out of business. It's a hard way of life, he says. His first 20 years, he quit 19 times. On the farm, our series continues. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. That these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts, they understand 
will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Zach Ashmore in studio to give us an update on how prices look and go into a deeper dive into the Mississippi cattle situation. Zach? Thanks, Mike. So, markets closed last week back on the downswing, but not in row crops. They got a bit of a boost. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, soybeans up 22 cents, a near 2% rise from the previous week. Last week's biggest loss, lean hogs, again, down 3.5 cents, an over 5% decrease from the previous week. Moving on to cattle, we've talked about how drought has affected the markets and herd size, and frankly, it's an issue that's likely to stick around for a while. I recently talked with MSU livestock economist Josh Maples to get a deeper look. The, the biggest issue affecting Mississippi specifically and broader is, is really the continued drought conditions, especially in the southern half of the state. It's really kind of expanded to some other areas. It, it's a statewide problem at this point. We've been very dry and that's caused all kinds of issues for cattle producers Out, outside of the normal ones that you might think of, you know, the Hey, a lot of producers have already had to start feeding hay for the year, uh, which is depleting their supplies that they would typically save for the winter time. But because things got so dry at the end of the summer uh, and as we're working our way into fall, we're already having to tap into some of those extra feed resources, which is going to uh, be difficult to manage. Uh, depending on what the winter brings us, of course. But the secondary impact, Zach, and one that you might not think of as much is, you know, we're at the time of year where we need to be think we need to be planting uh, winter grass. You know, we, winter grass is a huge component of the cattle production systems here in Mississippi, planting winter, winter ryegrass for cattle to graze over the winter months. When it's really dry like we've had for the last couple of months, you can't get that process started. I mean, you're, you're, throwing, you're throwing seed out there, uh, but you don't have any moisture for that seed to really take off. So we've got a lot of producers that are kind of sitting on hold in a lot of cases of, I need to be planting this, I don't have the moisture to be able to do so. Uh, and so that is just a continued issue that we're looking at. And it's forcing producers to make tough decisions about how many cattle they carry through the winter time both stalker cattle, but also looking at how many cows do I hold back? Do I cull a little bit deeper? How many heifers do I hold back? All of those decisions are being impacted by feedstuffs availability. Uh, and that's a big challenge for our producers right now. Yeah, the, the recent WASDE report did say that uh, cattle herds are being culled yep. back a bit. But not, not how, how, by how much though? That's the big question. We won't get our we won't get our next full look at that until the January first report comes out. But we did just have a cattle on feed report that came out that I thought was very interesting uh, because it it showed kind of a two different competing narratives, if you will, of placements were higher. We we actually saw about a six percent increase in cattle placed into feedlots uh, during September which was a surprise to some folks. As you know, we've been talking about tighter supplies and all of a sudden we had this pop in placements or, or cattle hitting feedlots. If you kind of peel back the data and, and the other side of that is we actually saw an increase in total feedlot inventory about a half a percent above where we were a year ago. Um, 
So if you think about it, on one hand, it's like, well, okay, well, we've been talking about tighter supplies, but all of a sudden we have more cattle in feedlots. What's going on? There's a couple of different things that are going on there. One of them is, you know, we saw a lot of heavy placements or heavy cattle get placed into feedlots in September. Uh, some of that is probably borrowing against some cattle that would have gotten placed later because of the dry conditions that we've talked about. And so maybe it's just a timing thing and not not that there's more cattle out there than we expect, it's just a timing of when they're coming into feedlots. But to me, the really interesting piece of this is the percentage of heifers that are in feedlots. And so if you look at the increase in inventory from a year ago, January 1 of 2024, we're going to have a smaller cow herd. We, we have not been expanding this year. We have continued to, continued to liquidate in 2023. All signs point to that, in my opinion. 2024 maybe is a stabilizing year. Maybe we stop liquidating, but the, the, the concept of, hey, we've got really high prices, cattle producers are about to start rapidly expanding, it hasn't materialized yet. And, and drought is a key reason uh, for that. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Mike? Thanks, Zach. And now back to our series on the farm and Mississippi Delta farmer Edward Jenkins. In this, the conclusion of his story, we learn a lot more about the kind of stress he was feeling, enough stress to make him think he'd suffered a heart attack. It starts with a look at the high cost of farm overhead, inputs. Those inputs, they cost money. The fertilizer, the herbicide, the insecticide, those can be very costly. And then also what happens if my equipment goes down? That's very costly to repair equipment. Then you also lose time and productivity waiting for those repairs to happen. With, with the price of equipment, a, a smaller farmer is, is just not, is not economical because if you're paying a $30,000 tractor note and you're only farming 300 acres, that might be all of your profit for that year. This field right in front of me is a field I just rented this year from my neighbors. It was small farmers. They farmed about 150 acres. And like I said, you, you can't make money off small acres. You have to be a certain size. or If not, you're just losing money. Yeah unless you're doing it for a hobby. My biggest stress was I, I wanted to get bigger and I couldn't get bigger, yeah. you know. There was no land available or I thought the rent was too high or, you know, I, I needed enough acres to, to make it a business so I could hire good people, I could buy quality equipment for them to run, and plus have some money left over. It is really hard for small farmers to grow their operations because a majority of the farmland is already being farmed on by the owners or is being rented out to other farmers who have been working on that land for years. So farmland does not become for sale that often, and when it does, the prices are extremely high. So it's extremely difficult for small farmers to grow their operations. There's also mental costs of farming that people don't often think about. Farming is mostly a year-to-year -year operation. You're just hanging on for that next year and you're trying to bring income into your farm and you're just trying to you know, make it to the next year, making, to, making it to the next planting, to the next harvest, and making sure that you're okay for that season. And there are no days off in farming. It's a 24-7 you know, job, 365 days a year, so they never really get a break. My first 20 years of farming, I quit 19 times. Every time I finished harvesting, I tell my brother that was it. What would make you want to quit? The, on, the night, on the 19th year, I made, I made quite a bit of money, and I was still just as stressed out with money as I was when I was broke. So my, the goal is to make money. And I thought once I made the money, it would relieve the stress. Okay, I made money. Okay, now I'm still worried. 
So this, I was thinking, I can't do it. <laughs> I was so stressed out, I went to the doctor and I thought I had a, a heart attack and, and a stroke. They did a lot of tests on me all day, and they told me I was healthy as a 21-year-old. It was just stress. It was just farm stress. It seems like in conversations with um, people on the Delta, most of the resources they use for mental health concerns are family, friends, um, faith-based organizations, things like that. There definitely you know, is a shortage of mental health resources, both in Mississippi and across you know, the country as a whole. And then there is also, of course, a stigma associated with seeking out professional care for mental health. Um, concerns, you know, stigma in the community, stigma, you know, around your friends, around your family that could prevent someone from accessing these resources. So we, as a whole, need to do a better job of saying it's okay to seek help, it's okay to get treatment, um, things like that. Every, everything I do is, is under a microscope. You know, everybody watches everything I do, waiting for me to make a mistake because I'm the youngest farmer around, so everybody think I'm gonna make mistakes. But every time somebody uh, told me uh, that I, I couldn't do it or I knew they was predicting me to fail, they gave me a lot of motivation to prove them wrong. I think uh, I already paved the way for my son and my neighbors and uh, anybody that looked like me and my nephew, I, I have a nephew, Leo Jr. I, I think one day that Leo and my son probably would take over the farm and by me, prove, me and my brother proving, proving that we can do it, they won't have nearly as much stress that we had. Because uh, everybody's seen it, seen it done. Very important, if you or someone you know is in emotional crisis, call or text 988 anytime for cri uh, confidential, free crisis support. Please get the help you may need. Well, next time on Farm Week, we announce this year's Tree Farmers of the Year. They're a husband and wife team, owners of 300 acres, a quarter century of grooming this forested land full of prized hardwoods and pines. He's a numbers man, she's an artist, but together they've poured their hearts and souls into their beloved tree farm, helped by a team of solid forestry professionals. Meet this year's Tree Farmers of the Year, next time on Farmway. And before we go, a fun little story. You'd think a stampeding herd of buffalo would be cause for concern, but not this time. A buffalo roundup took place recently in South Dakota. A spectacular sight. Reporter Anna Hamlin has more. We made some memories pushing 1,540 bison into a corral this morning. It's a once in a lifetime view for cowboys and visitors alike. Well, it's kind of like a bucket list, driving around down the Grand Canyon and then running the buffalo at Country State Park. I bought my first pair of cowboy boots. But some have turned the Buffalo Roundup into a family tradition. The first time we were here, there was 1,500 people. Yeah, it wasn't very many. Now it's, you know, thousands. Now it's gotten so huge, but it's fun to see the people from all over the country here. The event brings thousands of tourists to the park and region, but the purpose of the Buffalo Roundup is more closely tied to agriculture. All 50 states have Custer State Park bison in them, so yeah, through the years, through you know the 50 years of doing this plus 50 years of doing this, um, this herd has contributed greatly to the bison industry across across North America, for that matter. And yeah, it's just a lot of it does come down to herd health, ensuring 
that these animals, again, are just in the best health we can put them in, and that's why today we round them up. Over the next few weeks, the bison will receive vaccinations, calves are branded, and females will be checked for pregnancy, all before the November 5th auction. Kind of reminds me of Dances with Wolves. Great story. Well, a not so fun story. We have to say goodbye to Jonah after years with us wearing a variety of hats. We call him a Swiss Army knife around here. He's leaving for a new opportunity in the Office of Public Affairs here at Mississippi State University. This is his last time on the air with us. Well, Mike, thank you and thank you, Zach. The past few years of reporting and producing for Farm Week have been nothing short of incredible. Serving our audience and playing a small role in ag literacy around the country is an honor I've held near and dear to my heart. My time in Extension gave me an opportunity to give back to the organization that built me up into who I am today. And of course, thank you, the audience at home. It's been amazing running into Farm Week viewers in the wild and getting to hear your thoughts on the show. We're really gonna miss you around here, Jonah. Absolutely. Yeah, we absolutely are. And congratulations on your upcoming wedding. Thank you. It's so close. That's fantastic. Why don't you take us out? Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> They'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.